Alrighty, I hereby call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunderland Select Board and Finance Committee. The time is 6.31 p.m. Our first order of business will be to approve the minutes of our last meeting, which was February 5th, 2024. I motion we approve the minutes of February 5th. Second. We have a motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Three nothing, Jeff. Thank you. Alrighty. Our first order of business will be to um, have our introduction with our new South County EMS Chief, Josh. Josh, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself. And right. Thank you. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me to come down. Uh, I just wanted to introduce myself to the community, give somebody a face to the name, um, and just uh, let each of you know how to get in touch with me uh, directly uh, should the need arise. And take any questions if they should come up. But really, I just wanted to uh, introduce and say hello. Wonderful. Any questions at this time? So, we know you're just very recently there. Um, do you have anything that is like high priority on your list to tackle for changes, enhancements, anything? Sure. So, really, this is my um, starting my second week in the position. So, I'm still very much uh, in an assessment phase yep. of the organization. And I suspect that that will be ongoing for the next few months. Uh, yeah. So no great need for hurried change at this point. Uh, I will say uh, I'm very pleased uh, with the organization from what I see over the past week. Uh, it's an outstanding group of folks who are very dedicated uh, to the role that they play in the community. And I look forward to working with them. Good. I'm, I'm all new to the EMS. To how, how many calls a year does a group to get about? It's going to vary, but it's uh, ranging, you know, around 1,400, uh, 1,500 years. Okay. Good. Thanks. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank, right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, you for coming in. Us, don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. Yeah. Yeah. You. yeah. You know how to get a hold of me. You need to. <laughs> yeah, welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have our budget presentation for Franklin County Technical School. Would you like us anywhere? Or? Wherever you'd like to be, <laughs> except for our sheets. Okay. Russ, do you want me to pull up any of the sheets up, or if they you on? could, yeah, that yep. would be helpful. I do have. I was going to ask you. I have handouts. What do you want to start with? Uh, the summer. summer. Yeah. Right there. That is back of the matchbook. This is what we'll be discussing tonight. So uh, awesome. Something Thank you much. Here. This is the four pager, Jeff, so I can get people hard copy. Oh, yes. Does anyone? I think. Have these? Yeah, I think. Yeah. 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 And this is the big nasty budget book. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we work for educators who love to get verbose. Okay. So there's a lot of written mumbo jumbo in there, but there's also the numbers that we'll be talking about. Thank you. Yep. So quick info, I'm Russ Cobus, the business manager. Franklin County Tech with me is Liz Kimball Bouchard. She is the assistant business manager. Rick Martin, the superintendent, would normally be here with me or doing this himself. He's at the town of Burley. So we will be our second and third pin comms tonight. We had the town of Orange last week. The budget book that I handed out, this guy is going to our full committee Wednesday night. Weather permitting, and uh, it'll be a public hearing. So it'll be their first reading of the budget book. Their final vote will happen in March, second Wednesday of March. Just to let you know the logistics of what we do. Um, so I've got a brief for just a four page. I know your time is valuable. I know our assessments. There's no worth chattering change. Um, Liz and I can answer questions as they come up. 
if we start to throw around acronyms or anything like that that you don't understand, please be think about. So but the summary page. So there's two sections to our budget. Real simple presentation. The upper section that, that Jeff's got get on the board is sources of funding, so that's where all our revenues are coming in. Bottom section is going to equal the top section, and that's how we spend the money. And the fancy names for the bottom section are in the state functional categories that they like to see us report out on. And if you really are into Chapter 7 and foundation formulas, you'll notice the descriptions are similar to the state's foundation formula that we use. So my highlights for the sources of funding, the upper section, we are asking our towns uh, across the board, we have 19 member towns, the average ask from our towns is 3% increase in town assessments. So the first line is, that's what we're going to ask from our towns. We have a capital assessment that we've been assessing our towns. This is for a project that we did a handful of years back. We went out for bonding. It was for a windows and doors, a res resaling new roof, and uh, some parking, paving, athletic uh, track that was in that part. So we also assess our towns for that. Chapter 78, Franklin County Tech is a growing school and we have been in the last five, six years or so. We've been growing by double digits in the last few years of students. So we went from 550 students to 571 oh, in, in our foundation enrollment this past year. The superintendent and I were a little shocked at what we got for Chapter 7, especially after hearing that we had an education governor that the state is supporting through the Student Opportunity Act. They're giving extra funds into our Chapter 70 formula. We're in the fourth or fifth year. Year of that getting phased in. We are a growing school. We fully expected funds to come in in Chapter 70 above what we previously got. And you got 17,000. We got <laughs> yeah, a pittance. So basically the Chapter 70 formula gave us no money. Then they give every school as a little carrot, they give them $30 per student across the state. So add up your number of students, multiply it by 30 bucks, and that's where our, our little pittance is. Um, How many students now? We have 571 now. Five, so we went up from 560. So last year we had a four, an increase of 14 students and we saw almost $480,000 in fresh Chapter 70 money. Mm -hmm. So when we rolled into this year with 11 students, superintendent and I said, well, well let's throw in an extra 250 just to be conservative. We won't you know, try to project as much as we got last year and we got nothing. Mm -hmm. So they're tinkering or something's going on with the state formula. Our foundation budget grew, and the entire amount that the state formula said your foundation budget should grow by, they said your towns need to come up with that money. We're coming up with nothing. So I, I don't get it. We talked to Rob O'Donnell from, from DESE. He's the chief financial guy at Department of Ed. He started to explain to us, said, well, it must be this. And then we looked at that. And he goes, no, okay, so it must be this. We looked at another factor, no. The only thing he could come up with at the end of the phone conversation was, well, you mustn't have economies of scale, because some of the bigger schools are getting <laughs> Chapter 78, who grew faster, bigger than you did, and for whatever reason, we're not getting it. Not happy with the answer. If you guys see um, Natalie Blay or Senator Cumberford or somebody, please give them a kick in the shins on Chapter 78 funding for us. So we, we had budgeted, originally had in our administrative internal budget a little bit more money than Chapter 70, but this is what the governor came up with. We were hoping it's early in the process, in the legislative process, so we're hoping by May, June, when they go to final budget, Chapter 70 will have a little bit more money in it, but we're not going to bank on it. So we plugged in the governor's $5,974,000 for Franklin Tech. State aid for transportation is another one that came down. Last year, the state funded, I think, somewhere in the range of 90% reimbursement rate. So what that means is when 
Liz and I do our end of year data that goes to the state. The state will look at what we pay to transport and on school buses, our kids back home, uh, to and from home to school, and they gave us a 90% reimbursement rate. This 855,302 is an 80% reimbursement rate. So we didn't get quite as much transportation money as last year. Um, tuition from non-member towns. We have 19 member towns. Sunderland, obviously, you are one of them. We have your students coming in through our regular formula for uh, assessments. And then we accept some students from out of town, out of district. The out of district students, I take that in. That'll be very similar to Frontier's school choice revolving fund. We take it into a tuition revolving fund. Then we use a chunk of that revolving fund every year, as you can see from, from the chart, to help balance our budget. So my, the budget book that you see and my presentation is on our operating budget. I don't try to mix in grants with our budget. I don't try to mix in revolving funds with our budget because the operating budget is what's supposed to sustain your schools year, year in, year out. Yeah. Grants are supposed to supplement, so if a grant goes away, it, it really shouldn't affect your budget if it goes away. We can talk about COVID funds and ESSER later if you want. But. So we're using 752500 from our uh, outside district town. So I had to make up for some of the shortfalls in Chapter 70 that we were getting. Well, not shortfalls as far as real dollars, but our projections came up shorter than what the state gave us. So we're using 752000 Other revenues is interest we earn on bank accounts and things like that. So it's always a small small number and then E&D &D. so that's our free cash so we, we appropriate um, pretty much everything that we get in E&D &D, we turn around and appropriate to balance the following year's budget so the 580 I think my E&D got certified by DOR at 581 so we pretty much used up E&D &D. sounds risky but it's not we have in that tuition fund I was talking about we have probably 750,000, 650,000 unencumbered funds in there that we can use. That becomes our, our free cash. Schools cannot access free cash during the fiscal year. We have one shot at getting our free cash. The state says you gotta do it at the time that you pass the budget. So you can't, you know, I think you guys do a special town meeting or how, however you access free cash during the year, but we can't. So knowing that, we use as much of free cash as we can, and we keep reserves in a fund that the state doesn't cap us on. So we've got money over there. And we try to keep at least 5% of reserves in our, our tuition above. Bottom part of the screen is how we spend the money. So most of it, not too drastic in changes, but the first thing that probably should hit your eyes is instructional services line two actually went down by a couple hundred thousand dollars. Hmm. So again, the state aid came up short. We had to sharpen our pencil in certain areas. So what we were looking at in the instructional services is basically a, let me check my notes. We have a special ed position that um, the instructor this past year moved from special ed into a history class. We've got a a person who's a former para filling in for the special ed position. Special ed's a weird duck, and I know you probably hear this, and it's a, probably a major problem for the academic schools more than it is for vocational schools. But you got caps on how many students per teacher. Hard to kind of budget for until you have your students. Uh, like for us, we have applications, application process, and by the time we figure out the students coming in, it's May or June, we've already created a budget. So we take our best guesses. Special ed, we kind of guessed, and we had capacity to cut a teacher there. We had the teacher moving over to history, easy non-refill of a position. So we, we eliminated the special ed position. Um, Liz, what do we have for other things that came down in that? I think half a librarian is, is taken out of that position. Yeah. Again, hoping in more money mm -hmm. coming later on. So we trimmed up. The, the instructional services line by a couple hundred thousand dollars. Where did the, that money go? Some of that now went to student services. So student services is the 
student activities, athletics, and, and in this case, our increase happened from an SRO, school resource officer. So we've had probably for the last 10 years, a cop in the building, the school resource officer. That position we took off during the COVID years, thinking by the time COVID is done and those um, extra monies that we got through the ESSA grants, we thought we would have a COPS grant. There are things called COPS grants out there. We thought we would have one lined up. We don't. We're still applying for it. So this spring, the superintendent will apply for the COPS grant. We hope this is just a one year on the budget and come back off, hopefully, for a, a good chunk of time with the COPS grants. Because usually those grants will fund the position for several years. Pupil transportation, um, you may or may not be, Frontier might not have participated in the Franklin County uh, bid for transportation, but we did a new five-year contract for transportation. We had one bidder, mm -hmm. very disappointing. We, we collaborated as a bunch of schools to try to get more competition. So for us, I think you guys used to always have Ripco. I don't know if you still do for school transportation, but we get uh, Kismeskis Bus Company is usually the winner of the contract, and they were again this past year. That contract went up 11%. So a five-year contract ended. They capped themselves during that five years at two or two and a half percent cost of living increases in their budget, in their, in their contract. Inflation kind of ran crazy for a while in those five years, so I knew we were going to get kicked in the teeth when the new contract came out, and it's an 11% kick in the teeth, so transportation, school buses went up. We were also a growing school, so we were trying to put in an extra route in there. We have, yep. And that's why even though the total amount for the, for the transportation went up, you're saying that the state is still paying less of it because... Correct. So they pay it, they, they'll, they'll reimburse okay. for 80%, and they lag a year. So when Liz and I oh, okay. reported FY23's expenditures, that's what they use that on. Gotcha. Not even the current year, what we projected, they won't. They'll say, give us your real numbers and then we'll give you a reimbursement based on that. So what, this is a, I'm glad you asked the question, this is a double whammy year. Yep. We got a brand new transportation contract that went up. We won't see a reimbursement for th on this contract until oh, next year. So okay. that transportation number up top is from the previous fiscal. From FY 23s actually. So when I, I actually, you know, I went in, I calculated, and I said, oh, that's an 80% reimbursement rate, and that's yeah. what, I, what I was hearing yeah. that we were going to get. So that's, so that's that piece. Um, then we have things like plant operations. That went up a bit. Um, if you don't know, we are. We started a veterinary science program and we're building a veterinary clinic in a separate outbuilding. That's ready to come online this spring. We are also building nice. a multi-million dollar hangar off on the airport property. That's coming on board next year. Matter of fact, the steel structure is going up on that building. So we've got to have two outbuildings, need maintenance, heat, custodians, whatever, so that's what's gone into um, that. In the long run, we'll make that money back because we should be able to take in more students and we've got a high interest in veterinary science. And from the past open house visits we've had for the upcoming year, a lot of students interested in aviation mechanics and that's, that's the piece that we're gonna be doing in there. And then I know, I'm pretty sure you all belong to the Hampshire County Insurance Trust the insurance rates for health insurance went up eight percent this past year yes they did so that's what's the increase in our budget uh we only have about a four percent increase built in that budget so the superintendent and i still have to find funds by the time next year comes around. so hoping for chapter 70 and a little extra money there but if not we'll have to find funds elsewhere to cover the eight percent premium increases and then the other thing I want to note is it, you'll see a zero for rental of lease of equipment. We had done a performance contract with the Siemens Building Technologies a bunch of years ago to, to insulate our building, replace rooftop units, become more energy efficient. That contract or that long-term lease, it was a 15-year lease, ended. We took the money that we were appropriating for that line and we moved it down to capital stabilization. So you'll see uh, two years ago it went from 250 up to 750. So the capital stabilization fund is funding. So these two years, the 750 and the 750 should fund 
a feasibility study for our school. So we're busting at the seams. We are 19, circa 1976 building. We need to either renovate, do a major renovation through the MSBA program. MSBA is for the Mass State School Building Authority. So they get funds. They, last time we did a project with them, they reimbursed us about 70 cents on the dollar. So we're, we got to qualify for MSBA funding. They, they require a feasibility study, so we're going to have money set aside through our budget process for a feasibility study. Eventually, this, these funds, if we do a school building project, I can roll into the bonding for the project, and the state will reimburse me hopefully 60 or 70 cents on the dollar for these, these two things. But in the interim, we have to appropriate from the full not for the full cost of the feasibility study. I almost fell off my chair when I found out feasibility study for a small high school like us costs a million five. Well, that's the estimate that's out there. We, we check the state database for what people are paying for feasibility studies. I am in the wrong business, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, being an architect or an engineer, and you know, you know so. so that's our sources of funding. Uses of funding are up above. Now let's, do you have the assessment? There's a oh, question from a questions. finance committee member, yeah. Joe. Thank you very much. I agree. Just like what was our assessment last year? So last year, oh, I don't think I did my job the sheet, but I've got it in here. Maybe put on my readers. It wasn't much different. Last year, your assessment was 166,319. You had nine students last year. You have nine students this year. So the needle moved by... $180 or something like that, or $200. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So it wasn't, yeah, so I think 60 bucks a student. Or all not for spare time, just Was that total? Yeah, so it didn't move much. Okay. Um, so you're, you're fairly consistent. We have some towns that are, you know, town of Montague went from 93 down to 74 students. A town of Greenfield went from 117 up to 130 students. So some towns have some pretty wild fluctuations yep. in their environment. Yep. And that's basically, I mean, I shared, oh, and there's one other slide, Jeff, just so let me grab a little bit. It was the local contribution, yeah, that one right there. So this slide will show the, our sending schools, all right? All the other sending schools in Franklin County, their member towns that they share with Franklin County Tech. Yeah. So Frontier, you have somebody in Lake Deerfield Conway, and they're all members of Franklin County Tech. So for a sanity check, I like to check our per pupil costs, what we're asking from the taxpayers of Sunderland. So there are other schools per pupil costs, what Frontier is asking from Sunderland, and you can see we are very, very close to what Sunderland costs. So that seems normal, but it's not because a vocational school should be 1.5 times more expensive than the Sunday high school. But that's part of us small schools out here in Western Mass struggling with economies of scale. Yep. We're, we're a little bit lucky in that we can accept students in and kind of grow our school and try to achieve more economies of scale. And I think that's what's been happening for us in the past five or six years. And uh, I think a sweet spot for a vocational school, the last time I did numbers and looked across the state, was probably an enrollment of 800 or so. We'll never get there in Franklin County, but if we can get into the 600 to 700 range, I think we've got a pretty good pretty good economy of scale that we can achieve out here. Well, and with adding programs like the aviation and the veterinary, that's going to help with that Correct. because it's not just about increasing the, the students per program, it's having more offerings. And Correct. More Correct. And Correct. So that's going to help us do the bump, even living within our current building. And like I said, if we can build or renovate the core of our building and maybe create more outbuildings for some of the shops, instead of right now, most of the shops other than aviation and vet science are all part of our core building. Mm -hmm. You know, they're on the outer edges of our core building, but they're all part of our core building. If there was a way that we can start, almost start a campus, mm -hmm. 
and keep our core building, renovate that for academics, and maybe increase our capacity for enrollment. We don't want to go crazy because, as we all know, enrollment is doing a slow decline for the last 10, 15 years, and nobody says it's going to be different. So we expect the plateau probably by next year after the aviation program fully gets going. So we're going to accept freshmen this coming fall. Next fall will be freshmen and sophomores. It's a long fall, so we'll build it up over time and I think right around by the time we got seniors over in that program we're probably going to plateau and do that wise. Are there any other programs that are on the horizon that you guys are thinking about adding? We were looking at uh, environment, environmental sciences. You know, a lot of our you know, rural kids, you could be environmental police, you could do different things with the environmental sciences. There is, if you've had projects in town, a need for so when we when we're looking at new buildings to construct new buildings and new systems even the Siemens building technology systems that we put in are all computer driven you know if you got solar panels that you find to monitor monitor the wells for uh, another you know the what is it uh, geothermal. geothermal thank you geothermal system depending on what you do so the systems are so efficient but also so complicated now, there's a need for not your average, hey, you're the head of maintenance guy. You need somebody who knows the computers, part of it, who can monitor the systems and know, you know, maybe a little bit of HVAC, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So that's another program other folk schools across the state as they're building new buildings are going, hey, there's a need for this stuff. And as, as cities, towns start to build newer buildings with these complicated systems, yeah. we figured there might be a need for that. Great. Yep. Any other questions? I'm just going to end up thinking, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm not going to <laughs> And we're always available if somebody thinks of questions later. Like I said, the budget doesn't get finalized in March, so you know, either give me a call or the superintendent's office a call sure. to say, hey, we're on the select board of finance, you know, one of your member towns, can I ask, blah, blah, blah. And we'll get back to you. Excellent. I just want to underscore something I think I heard you say earlier, which is enrollment's going up, people are happy with the school, things are going great, and the state is funding less. So this past year, yes. Okay. So <laughs> for years, <laughs> that's why I said, you know, because we fully expected we had a, you know, one year doesn't make a trend, right? So we had like a four-year trend of growth, four or five-year trend. The superintendent and I, hey, we have a growth. We know that we're going to get more chapter seventy this year. No. So at the knees. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Yeah. So that happen after across. the whole cut the state did after the the, the nine C's. Wrong? Well, yeah. So the nine C's should be cutting. That, is a cut in the current year, right? right? So when she, when the, when the governor was building 25s, we thought it would be tighter, but we didn't think it would just disappear. So I, you know, I went down all the state data. I found another vocational school that had 11 students, and they got they got about a half a million of chapter 70. We had an 11 student increase. We didn't get it. the only thing. And again, I had we had the finance guy from Desi on the phone. The only difference you can find is they were an 1,100 student school. We're a 600 student school. So that's when he came up with most of the economies of scale. But it makes no sense. We had 14 students last year, a 14 student increase, we got a half a million dollars. This year we had an 11 student increase, we get nothing. Mm. Yeah, and, and that argument sounds backwards to me. A smaller yeah. school with, a, with 11 student you know, increase yeah, should have, have yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, the economy yeah. scale hurts small schools. You don't then give right. more money to the larger schools because somehow they're larger. I will have a conversation with our representative and our yeah. senator about and that I one. Know, and I know through our MAVA and our different groups, the superintendent belongs to them, we talk to the legislators too, but it's, it's frustrating. Very frustrating. Just from a budgeting perspective, it's sure. frustrating. Sure, sure, yeah. You know, we, we feel we're fairly conservative. We felt oh, we, we've got a good handle on this, and we got like, what? <laughs> well, and, and it, as you said, in a year where inflation is out of control and health insurance is going up eight percent and transportation is going up eleven percent right. and all these other things, mm -hmm. to have the increase be zero is even so, even if you were stagnant, so you're stagnant the, population. The inflation yeah. factor that the state used on the foundation formula was one point 
5% or 1.2%, which makes no sense to me. Yeah, so I, would, I would love to go in that world. <laughs> last year, whatever calculation we came up with, they said, oh, we have to cap you at 4.5% because we're not going to pay any more inflation than that. So they capped us last year. I think inflation might have been at 8 and 7 or 8%. Yeah. This year, I know inflation is a little bit, a little bit down from that. It's not that much and down. all of a sudden, we're giving you an inflation factor of 1.5%. So I... I have my conspiracy theories on all this. Well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, yes. Anything else on the board before we wrap up? There's a question. Oh, thank yes, so Joe. That might be his hand still from before. Sorry, that's the same old, old question. So we're all good. Again, I really appreciate how well you balance the budget with, you know, with all those factors from Chapter 7. It's really disturbing that they didn't re-up, especially with your growth. But, but well done. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I do also want to echo what Joe said earlier about the school. You guys do a great job. Both my kids go to Franklin Tech. They love it. Um, Thank you for the customers. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, just a small shout out to Miss Miller and Mr. Wolfram, um, my daughter's oh. teachers in, in their in her advanced manufacturing class. Um, they invited me to come in last week to come through the facility. We were wonderful. I cannot praise them enough. They're yeah. absolutely great people. And Nicole's a graduate from our school, Miss Miller. She is, and she can't speak. She cannot speak more highly of the school and of the staff and everything. So yeah. great job. We really appreciate it. So I just want to say we thought we entered the wrong meeting because I didn't see a fine cabbage. Sure. I know. <laughs> yeah, I, know. Just, I didn't know. Yeah, where am I? Where am I? Yeah. <laughs> they have definitely been fixtures in this particular building for quite many years, yes. So thank you very much. Absolutely. And thank you for all the uh, supplemental material. It helps to have everything. Yeah, I mean, the details in the book. So like I said, if you see something that looks funky and you have a question, please feel free to. All right. You might not get back to you within the few minutes, but we'll get back to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great one. All right, that is our only budget presentation for today. Um, next up, we have our primary election warrant. The primary, sorry. Do we want to just do the budget uh, preview while the finance committee is here, and then they can? Sure, they don't need to hear us do the warrant. That's fine. All right, uh, we'll come back to the warrant. Let's talk about the operating budget. First look. Jeff. All right. So um, this, this budget does. Um, is a first draft. <laughs> I'll start with that. Um, a number of things are estimates, um, but I think generally they're pretty good estimates. The one thing um, that we don't have yet, we don't have the South County EMS budget. Um, we don't have final numbers for the elementary school in Frontier, but I have a pretty good idea of where those are going to be. Um, and then uh, the salaries for um, non-union, non-contracted personnel, which the personnel committee is discussing, and um, I think we'll have a proposal shortly. So, um, the bottom line. Oh, sorry, and this also doesn't include any new growth. I don't have that figure yet. Um, it at, it assumes that local receipts are going to stay even. Usually, they go up at least a little bit, um, but. And, and everything that was put in to the uh, expenses is what departments requested, the most that they had requested. So a couple weeks ago, we heard the police chief say, hey, here's my budget with a new full-time officer. It's slightly more, but here are the offsets. So that's what was included in this. Um, Quick question for you on yes. that. Um, are these numbers including the, the prop 2.5% or this just with the with taxes being the same as they were last year? This is with a two and a half percent increase uh, to the levy, but not new growth. Okay, that, that's yeah, that's what I wanted. To yep. so, so yeah, that's the top line. Um, we don't have any idea what the new growth is going to look like. Definitely not like the last couple of years because we had apartment complexes and senior centers. Yeah, over there. my my guess is I, I would be happy with fifty thousand. <laughs> I think it would be. Um, but it, it also depends on Sanderson and whether or not that was... And we, we, last year we budgeted under for Sanderson because we wanted to be conservative on that. thought so. So I feel like maybe we will end up a little bit higher on that than we thought, which would be nice. That's my hope. Okay. Um, so all in all, we uh, are at... Or the town 
is requesting about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars more than what we are likely to raise. So that's sort of like the gap that we have to close um, between now and town meeting. And so we have a we have a budget increase of about four hundred, and the revenue is going up by well here it's going up by about sixty thousand. Right. Okay. Um, and that that does include. We got confirmation, 8% increase on health insurance. Okay. Um, yeah. So we're fairly confident that give or take the things we can't control, this is pretty close to what we're going to end up. Yeah. I, and I think, yeah, there's, um, I'm going to guess there there's going to be six figures that we're going to have to figure out how to yeah. either raise more or, um, or spend less. Yeah. Which, but as you said, this this includes everything that was asked, not necessarily Correct. the and, standard, you know. And currently does not include any funds from free cash to balance the operating budget, which in past years we've used at least about 100000 so. Yeah. Okay. And you, and you said free cash has not been certified yet, or it has been? It has. It has. Yes. What's, our, what's our final free cash number? I want to say it's, it's 470 and change, I think. 471, okay. 472. All right, and last year, if I remember correctly, we had like five ish, and we did like a thousand in operating, or I mean, a hundred in operating, two hundred in stabilization, and two hundred in capital stabilization, or something like that. Yeah, it was uh, about one hundred and seventy-five in operating, and two hundred into each of the stabilizations. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, and this is sort of a little bit of a, a tangent, but um, our general stabilization fund, we don't ever use money out of that, do we? Or at least not since I've been here. That yes. Okay. Yep. What's our balance in that currently? Do you know? I believe it's about I believe it's about six hundred thousand. Okay. Um, I'll double check. And how often, longer term than a year and a half I've been here, do we end up using money out of that? We've not used it since I've been here, and last year was the only time we've added to it. So okay. um, I I will look back and get you an answer to that. Okay, so that's something that we don't always put money into. We just did last year because we had the money to put into it. And it was a smart move yeah. to do. Okay. Which I appreciate because I'd much rather have 600 in it than 400. Yeah. And I um, think the town uses it as our rainy day fund, right? And yeah. And we still have to go to a special town meeting to appropriate out of it. Yes. Yep. But we have it there if that has to happen. Okay. Yep. Um, so if, the, if this year we ended up having more free cash go to operating less and not put money in the stabilization, that's not an aberration from normal as much as it is sort of a return to normal because... We don't tend to put money in there. Okay. I mean, ideally, I wouldn't spend a ton, of, a ton of free cash on the operating budget, but yeah, you know, this is going to be as the but business manager was saying. This is a year where a lot of a lot of shoes are hitting each other at the same time, and eight percent on the insurance is nothing to scoff at. You know. No, it is not. Okay. Any other questions on that? So, uh, just a reminder thing. I was looking at the second page. Um, your CU column, the last column there, mm -hmm. the percentage decrease yep. or increase. Yep. That's being calculated off of the new budget, not the original budget, right? It's like a, a negative 150% decrease. That's the 15,000 off of the 10,000 off the 25, right? It, it is, yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and that's, I need to make sure that that works for the first section, because <laughs> clearly that's not right. Um, and that decrease in the accounting expense, that's because we're not having to spend double pay for accounting software this coming year. We're finally getting off of the old software and back to only having to pay one Correct. sizable chunk of money for that. Yep. Okay. So it looks nice, but that's really just a last year was hard kind of year. <laughs> okay. Um, another thing that this budget doesn't include is the insurance advisory committee had recommended um, the employer share for health insurance increase by two and a half percent. This maintains the 65-35 split. Um, one of the things we had our meeting with our, our health insurance rep today and she mentioned that a lot of a lot of the increase is because for whatever reason we seem to that's a medication
applications. So understanding that the insurance advisory committee didn't want to change benefits, we're looking at options of hey, do we create a copay for you know, or increase the copay for prescription drugs um, so that it doesn't fall on everybody who's taking the insurance, just those people that, you know, have prescriptions. Um, can we, do we, I think she said we could reduce it by about five and a half percent if we added a $250 deductible per person and a $750 deductible, annual deductible per family. Um, for prescription specifically? No, that would be, that would be in general. Okay. And so talking about, okay, if we do that, do we want to create like a flexible savings account to help offset? Obviously that would be a, more of a burden if they have to pay out of pocket. <coughs> um, so we're looking at all those options. If, if the select board has any um, direction or advice on, on where to go insurance wise, um, it would probably be the time because we need to tell them in about a month if we're changing the plan in order, we have to sign it by April 1st. So, I mean, my first, my first reaction is we need universal health care in this country. <laughs> and I have very few opportunities to have a soapbox, so this is one of them. Um, but no, um, I am hesitant to put any burden, any additional burden onto families who are already dealing with having to pay for expensive medication. That in general translates to that family is dealing with chronic health issues or otherwise. I'm not sure I want to necessarily transfer burden specifically onto people who are already dealing with that kind of stuff. That's not necessarily the direction I feel like the town wants to go in. Um, sort of the point of, of health insurance in the first place is to not have that happen, is to have everybody pays in the same amount so that the people who need the insurance don't get screwed over. So my, my personal opinion on that is I'd rather not make that harder on the people who are actually needing to use that. Um, in terms of an overall deductible, I think if we end up doing 2.5% more of the of the of the payment ourselves, but add an deductible, it's not really helping anyone at the end of the day if we do that. So I'm not sure that, you know. What is the deductible now? Nothing. So, and the other aspect, which is slightly less lovely, is the more affordable and wonderful we make the health insurance, the more likely people who aren't currently using it will be to use it. And I'm not saying that's not necessarily a bad thing. We want to make it so people will have health insurance. But we also have to keep that in mind in terms of the cost we look at. When we, when we make it more affordable, we also run the risk of adding more people to the plan the following year and having that increase that we budget for end up being a much larger increase because we add three more employees on the, on the town plan. Um, so just in terms of, you know, I would be more apt to offer a health savings plan in general to help offset, you know, the costs. Um, because that doesn't target certain certain people, you know. And I had asked specifically about a health savings plan, and what I was told is those are only available for the high deductible plans. Mm -hmm. So if you have like a $2,000 deductible, it's to help offset it. But, but she said flexible spending accounts or um, HRA, health reimbursement mm -hmm. accounts, um, where it would be options, yeah, it would provide support. I mean, I guess another direction we could go in would be to offer a, you know, a, a set amount of money to all town employees as a a general reimbursement, whether they take the the health plan or not, um, which would be a way to make it more affordable for people without actually encouraging people to switch from their spouse's employer plan onto our plan um, and would also help the people who don't take our insurance actually get something out of it. If that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, how many choices do they have now? For plans? Uh, there, there are three plans. Um, each plan has individual two, two right, members. But there's three family. separate plans. Yeah, they have two now. HMOs and a PPO. So, if you added, and again, it, it become I know there's downsides to it also, but if you added a fourth option with a deductible, you know what I mean? Then 
people can make that decision. And I think the cheaper plans, we our percentage of the cheaper plan is less. Well, then, you know, they're accepting that plan, especially if they're a single person and your deductible is $250. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, yeah, and then basically the same plan with or without a deductible, so. I know it starts, you start getting too many plans and it's like. Right. The administration, but. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but, but then also. Then you kind of have some control over your your choice, right? Are you will because then it becomes are you willing to pay the eight percent increase to keep exactly what you have, or are you more interested and people can make that choice, or are you more interested in saving money I am the deductible. And paying that higher deductible. Right. And we do have I think a couple yeah. of hands up. I'm not so we'll go to Joe first and then Cindy. Joe go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, two things. Uh, well, the first one, the insurance, I, I hear you. I know those health savings accounts, um, you have to have the higher deductible. The benefit is, though, what you put in your health savings, if you don't use it, it earns interest and you can keep it when you retire and use it for health spending after you retire. So, but it, it is not easy unless you have the high deductible. So. Um, and you're right, too many insurance plans just gets confusing and weighed down. It's hard for people. And, and again, we're going through a lot of insurance stuff now, so I've learned a lot. You know, the deductibles, you know, is it a, is a challenging thing because you don't want to increase the deductible for the people that are going to end up paying a lot on their deductible. Um, but if there was a way to offset it with a um, you know, the flexible spending account where they save on pre-tax dollars. It's one way to offset it. So that's just two cents. The other one goes back a little bit. The 471000 um free cash, Jeff, where were we about, just roughly, where were we last year at this time? Because I remember what we spent it on last year, I think, as I already mentioned. But where were we? Did we have this much last year? Yeah, at this time last year, we had no idea how much free cash we had. For about three more months, we had oh, no yeah. idea. But <laughs> we, ultimately, it was uh, about six hundred and fifty, I think. Yeah. So we had about two hundred. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And we're at four seventy-one right now. Correct. Is yeah. what we just said. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Cindy, you have something? Yeah. Um. I was on the insurance advisory committee, and I thought. Jeff, does the three plans that you mentioned include the new one that was added that was more of like an in-state plan? Yes. Okay. Yep, that, that's the third. Right. And is there a cost for the flex spending to the town? I know when we had it once before, there was a cost. The town did pick up that cost, but I thought the last time it was discussed, there was going to be shifting to the employee. I don't know how much that is. I have it through my husband's work, but I don't know what they pay. But it's a much larger uh, organization. Yeah. So there, there is a cost to go with the person who would service the plan. Um, I okay. think they said it was like two hundred and fifty dollars a year, and then like I don't know five dollars a month per person that's involved. Um, the town can choose to uh, put money into the account or it can be completely funded by the employee. Um, but for both flexible spending and health care reimbursement, the town basically puts the money up front because it's a debit card and then as the money comes out of people's paychecks monthly, that account gets reimbursed. So there is a co there is a significant cost of the upfront cost to the town, but ultimately um, we should recoup the majority of it. Okay. Was that the only option they offered? 
I know ours works a little differently. I, I know when I did it with the town before, it was the debit card. It was a little clumsy at the time, but I'm hoping things might have changed by then. Just saying. Yeah, I mean, the, she mentioned a debit card. I don't know. Okay, yeah. I just know um, what we learned when we were all meeting last year is the town offers an excellent insurance package um, and low deductible or low co-pays, which does drive the cost a little bit. And so no one wants to switch out of that. And that's always the, the balance of how to make it more affordable. And yet everyone wants to keep the same benefits that we're offering now, which are a national plan. I personally haven't seen a plan like that in years. <laughs> for all this stuff that we've you know been through but um that's one of the challenges the committee had so go ahead and say. so big big picture wise i don't know if this is the year to go increasing the town's contribution given an eight percent increase overall and the other stuff that the town's is absorbing this year from all the other budget sources um i'd love to but we also did make a change last year to the insurance and maybe we skip a year and next year we talk about the two and a half percent change. That's sort of where I'm at. I don't know, Crystal or Dan, how you guys feel about that? That's, that sounds reasonable, reasonable to me. Well, I th yes, I mean, I think we need to see what that cost of that deductible plan would be. Mm -hmm. To get a real cost on that for a single, a two-person, a family, and if that really, I mean, five percent is a lot difference. Um, you know, and then I think we need to look at it and decide maybe we can't. And again, we don't know it until we actually see the numbers, right? Yeah. Can on some of the plans we jump it up, but on other ones not? You know, can we say on those high deductible or the the small network plans we can increase? That was something. Didn't we? Don't we have to on the lowest plan again because of the the Obamacare regulation? Maybe we're close. <laughs> we're um, it, it depends on uh, I think the salary adjustments that we make um, based on the current salary. That plan is about ten dollars more expensive than it needs to be. Um, so, but if we're doing a cola and a wage adjustment for these people, then um, it may. It but we're, we're close either way, though. Yeah. So, but we do pay 70% of that plan. So to your point about can we increase some and not others. <coughs> right. And that's, I think, we need to see real dollars yep. Yep. before we can make, you know, and maybe we do add another one that we can pay 70% of versus across the boards. What percentage of our employees um, are using our health insurance? Mm, ish. I want to say a third would be my guess. A third? That's low. Mm. Yeah, seventy-five. So, and that's what I was saying before is that one of the things we need to be careful of is that we don't make things so sweet that all of a sudden a bunch of people move from their spouse's plans onto our plans. And not that that's a huge concern, but three people move over and that could be a, a pretty big swing for us in terms of the, the, the costs all around. Um, you know, and, and, and to Crystal's point about increasing certain plans, number one, I think we need to at least have a discussion about increasing the lowest plan again because of I don't want to be a dollar twenty-five over that limit and then end up getting in trouble over it. Um, nor does it make sense to to squ skate by this year if next year we're probably going to have to be increasing it by five percent or whatever in order to make it compliant. Um, you know. And the other thing I learned is that we can never be a hundred percent sure that we're okay. 
um, because it's based on family income. So, you know, if this lowest paid employee has a spouse that's making a lot of money, we don't really need to worry about them. <laughs> so, um, because we don't know the full family situation, we can never be a hundred. 100% sure that we're okay. Which but, is, again, why I'm saying like it, yeah. it makes sense to have that lowest plan be so affordable that we're sure that we're within a nice margin, not just that we're right on the border of being okay. Um, but also, in terms of the town's contribution, you know, if an employee selects a lower plan, the town's paying less money for that employee's plan. And as an employee of the town, they're entitled to a certain amount of money out of our budget for their health insurance. So I, I feel better about kicking more money into the lower plans than I do about kicking more money on the higher plans that we're already paying a lot of money for. Um, right, they don't all have to be the same percent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, and, and it really, uh, the same employees taking the higher plan, the town's paying twice as much out of pocket for that plan. It makes sense to have, be like, oh, well, you're saving the town a bunch of money. We'll help you do that a little dollar, bit more. Dollar than amount can be equivalent, yeah. So, my two cents. Thank you. Joe, looks like you have your hand up again. I do, I do, as I flash my curly whites on you. Um, all great points being made. I agree, we don't want to make a lot of change. We made a big change last year, and also, you know, it is a really good plan. The question I had was about the deductible. Was the discussion, Jeff, about in-network and out-of-network deductibles? Because that can make a big difference, too. I don't know. That she just said okay. two fifty seven fifty, but um, I she's uh, our our rep is gonna draft up some plans and give us some hard numbers, so I'll make sure to clarify that, Jeff. Right, because I because I know that like, we you know we have an in network deductible that you know we we use, but then the out of network deductible is on top of that, and sometimes that can get um, can be a surprise for people. So I, yeah, I just stress double checking those two things. Thank you. Thanks. All right. I think that's everyone on the phone. Anything else from the board? I'm good. Okay. okay. Um, did you want to go over anything else in the budget, or is that pretty much the, the yep. first look you want to do? Okay. Does the uh, finance committee want to vote themselves out so they can head on out? Vote ourselves out? Well, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I motion that the finance committee the finance committee select board part of this meeting. Finance finance part of this meeting. I need a second. Joel's gone. <laughs> All right. Second the motion, Joel Lyons. All right. We have a motion. All in favor? Aye, Joel Lyons. Aye, Val. Aye, Linda Forge. All right. That's three. Sarah, I think I too. Aye. All right. Sarah. <laughs> Yeah, nice. Thank you. Thanks Thank you all once joining. again for joining us. Yep. We will see you soon, I am Thanks sure. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye, Linda. Swinging back around to our primary election warrant. Jeff. Yes. Um... It is a presidential election year, oh, yeah. and we have a warrant that needs to be signed um, for the primary on March 5th. Um, there's also, and Wendy is not on to correct me, so she'll tell me what I got wrong tomorrow. Um, I think there's a local committee member, a state committee member, and a county committee member as well. County, is that right? Something like that, yeah. Um, there was also a few dates uh, that the clerk wanted me to mention. The town caucus is going to be March 4th at 6 p.m. right here at 12 School Street. Um, the annual election, so the caucus is where you put your name in if you want to be elected. Annual election is May 4th, 2024. The presidential primary, March 5th. Um, Sunderland Public Library from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on the day of. You can register to vote up until February 24th, so another week and a half. Um, the application deadline for vote by mail is February 27th. Um, 
If you need voter information, please check our website, townofsunderland.us, or call the town clerk. Um, she can also help with changing party affiliation, vote by mail, registering, um, absentee or uh, voting application, or if you just want to track your ballot. And then early voting, um, and this is something I think you all need to vote on as well, is Saturday, February 24th from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday, February 26th, 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Tuesday, February 27th, 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., Wednesday, February 28th, 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., Thursday, February 29th, 9 a.m. to noon, Friday, March 1st, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., and that would be here um, at 12 School Street. And you said you need us to vote on that? Yeah. So, okay. how motion that we accept the early voting dates and times as presented by Jeff? Second. All right, we have a motion made and seconded to accept the early voting dates and times as presented by Jeff. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Three nothing, Jeff. Thank you. All right. Do you need us to vote on the town warrant or just? Yes. Okay. Yep, so, I will also entertain a motion to accept the town warrant. Motion to accept the town warrant as presented by Jeff. Second. We have a motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Three nothing. Thank you. Wonderful. Is that all you need for that? What's that? Is that yes. all you need for that? Yep. All right. That's it for new business today. Uh, under old business, the first thing we have is an ARPA request for the elementary school lighting repairs. So I'm not going to um, actually ask for money unless the school knows. <laughs> and I don't know you if don't you know. Okay. To my knowledge. So I, I will tell you what happened, and that I will probably be coming back for um, a request for ARPA funds. Uh, the oil tank replacement. Um, there were some electrical wires that were not on plans. Uh, the contractor tore out the wires. Um, didn't tell anybody about it. I guess somebody noticed that the lights were out up behind the school. Um, so we invented- uh, the, the parking lot is- Oh, the parking lot too. Okay. Okay. Um, so we're, we're tra talking to the contractors and, and the designers. Um, my argument is I, I don't think it's our fault. I, I understand they don't think it's their fault. So maybe we figure out if we can all split the difference. Um, so we're having those conversations. And then once we have a, a firm figure, um, mm -hmm. there will probably be an ARPA So request. who installed those lights in the wiring for those lights and never updated the plan? Was there an asbelt? <laughs> I don't know. I, um, because yeah. The town shouldn't be paying anything of this. Well, it should have been a, an as-built draw. So, but logistical, into, into logistics. Yeah. If we do approve ARPA money for it, I'm assuming the ARPA money would be for the full cost to get it going, and then we would be reimbursed by the other parties, or would it be, we you guys nail down what what the town's on the hook for? We approve our part. The contractor comes in with their part. Mm. Um. And the reason I'm asking is that if we approve ARPA money, let's say we approve $50,000 of ARPA for this, I'm just pulling a number out for, for simplicity's sake, and it, we end up deciding it's going 50-50, the contractor's going to pay 20, 25, we're going to pay 25. If we get reimbursed 25 from them, but it came from ARPA funds originally, what happens to that money? Does that just become free cash? Or does that have to go back into ARPA? So, probably, and... I don't get in trouble. I, I would talk to a lawyer before I actually did this, but I yes. think what would happen is we would expend all the money and we would pay for the project and then the contractor would donate some money back to the town, which we would put in the general fund. Okay. Um, would, would be how I, I would suggest we do that it. Sense. If the, the thing I'm trying right. to avoid is us getting reimbursed ARPA money that then disappears because it's, it's December. Right. You know, that's yeah. what the, the, the so I don't, I don't want to end up in a position where we've earmarked it, we don't spend it elsewhere, and then $30,000 goes away. Because if that's the case, we might as well pay for the whole thing anyways, because it's all going to go away. Um, so I, that's just my concern there. I just want to make sure that we're covering ourselves in that respect. And, and for all of you and, and people listening at home, I think the initial estimates are like 10,000. So we're not okay. talking like 50, right? We were told 5,000 for the electrical work and the cost of the excavation would be 5,000, but 
the town has been doing that for us without additional. Yes, the highway has been doing the digging and providing. Okay. The right, but then there's, you've got to get the, no matter what they do, you've got to get that documented where they are so this doesn't happen a second time. Sure. So there's going to be an engineering cost. There's going to be an update of records cost. But also, in terms of the excavation, just because our town washes, you know, or rubber each other's backs or whatever the sitting is, doesn't necessarily mean we want to extend that to the contractor. If the contractor's on hook for half of it, I want the contractor to be on hook for whatever percentage of the whole thing, including the excavation costs, because just because we're shifting town funds from George's budget that could be going to repair our roads, doing this instead doesn't mean that that, that should be a, a boon to their part of it. Right. If it ends up being that, that it's 5000 to do the excavation work and 5000 for electrical, great. They'll pay the 5000 for electrical and George can do the excavation and we're good to go. That's sort of what I'm, I'm getting at is I want to make sure we, we're counting the whole cost, including what we would be paying if we weren't going with George. Um, because, again, that's not... And we need to make sure the records yes. get updated. And I, I would love to, to, to know who installed it without putting it on the plans also. That would be something I would like to know. Right. Was, wasn't as built or quiet, please, that's the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. they try to save money and don't pay for it as built. Correct. Yeah. Just do you have anything and, you want to add? And on this that? is what happens when you do that. That's right. Yeah. You know, go, oh, someone will remember they're there, and this is exactly what happens. Yep. Why not? Well, that's why you call things safe, so this stuff doesn't happen. So if it's not on well, the no. plan, though, you know. Right, so it does. Yeah. 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 Right, but there's, if it's not marked on a plan, <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like it, it has to be on the plan, otherwise the whole the whole system falls apart. Otherwise, um, all right. So yeah, so keep us updated on that request. Um, obviously, once we know what the share is that the town is going to need to absorb, um, we'll re reassess it at that point. All right. Uh, select board updates. Dan, let's start with you, and we'll go down this way. Um, I don't know if I. The only thing I can tell you is that I, I got some bad news on the CPA. Um, still thinking about it, but. Um, we applied for the CPA, and then I, I actually reached out to get some guidance just to make sure that we were eligible uh, to apply for CPA for a feasibility study for a shared use path within a road right of way. I got some feedback back saying that for sidewalk projects, because of the case in Norwell, uh, you can't use any CPA money for either a feasibility study or construction. The Norwell case was a sidewalk. Basically, it was a sidewalk job on down the highway. I think they had it in a plan, but then they thought well, they'd use CPA money. No oil appropriated it. It's a million and a half, I think, dollars to build the sidewalk. Uh, ten residents challenged it, and they went to court, and they won because they said it was more highway kind of sidewalk than a recreational use. Um, I'm not sure that the shared use path and the sidewalk are equivalent. The shared use path would be separate. It's, you know, bikes where everybody can ride in it. It's recreational. I mean, trying to connect to the North Duck. So I think it's a little bit different than a, than a sidewalk, but I'm not sure it makes sense to challenge that or, or, or what to do. I, I mentioned to Jeff today, maybe we should ask council to take a quick look, see if he thinks this, you know, if this, if, if, if he thinks it's enough of a difference that we could hang a hat on it to go forward and see if we could uh, get CP, uh, CPA folks to, to agree. Um, and it seems like it would be a local decision that it would only get a problem to this challenge. Uh, but again, asking maybe, maybe asking a lawyer might make some sense just to see if it was worth pursuing because we want to uh, limit, the, limit the time of the town staff to do the match. Okay. But we still have the committee to set up, so I don't know where we'll be on that. I think it's a good thing to have if we be able to make our application stronger. But I'm not sure if it makes sense to go to the next step and you know, ask for that. All right. We can discuss that with Jeff. Yep. All right. Uh, Crystal, anything from you? Um, went over and met with Josh, who, you know, came and introduced himself this, mo this evening. Um, you know, just went over, talked about, you know, kind of where as members of the board of oversight we stand in you know just you know little introductions but that was about it and i think i've got south county ems tomorrow so maybe next week i'll have something sounds good um i had both capital planning and um 
the uh, contract negotiations this past week. Um, nothing to report from the contract negotiations. Those is semi-closed. Um, from the Capital Planning Committee, um, and Jeff, please jump in with numbers if I'm getting the wrong. Our total request this year was about 600,000-ish. Um, we have about four, for obvious reasons. Oh, actually, no, sorry, we actually have about six because we have 200 already in there and we're having 400 more go in. Um, but we're, we're trying to avoid spending that down. We're trying to actually make it grow because we know we have a school roof coming up soon and we don't want to get ourselves caught with our pants down and have no money there. So we're trying to spend less than the capital appropriation that we're, that we're making. Um, to that end, we had George come in, um, went over, his was by far the largest chunk of requests, um, and went over them. Um, he made it clear that his requests were sort of a, this is what I'd like to get done list, not necessarily a this is what has to get done this year list. And so we were able to go through and kind of prioritize which ones made sense to do this year, which ones made sense to push out. Um, the big item on that is the loader that we've been talking about for a couple of years now. Um, I think that is 600 or 750 or something like that. 270. 270. Yes, 270. Thank you. That's why I asked you for the numbers. <laughs> um, 270,000, which he put in as a single time cost on that list. And so the first thing we did is we said that's not going to be a single time cost, right? We're going to do a lease to own on that. Yes, that's going to be a four or five year lease, something like that. So that won't be an actual that much. It's going to be more like maybe 70 a year for those years. Um, the one thing we did keep in mind is we currently have both the truck that we just bought last year and also what was backhoe. It? backhoe from the year before that we're, we're already in that four or five year paying it off chunk. And so this would add another about 70 to that, which or no, 60 to that. We have about 60 that we're already paying. It'd be add another 60. So for the next four or five years, about $120,000 of the capital budget is already spoken for from those three pieces of equipment. Um, not that that's a necessarily a horrible thing, just it is what it is, and I want to make sure everyone was aware of sort of where that recurring cost piece of that comes So are out. the other two pieces of equipment leases or loans? They're leased to owns. Leased yeah. to owns? Okay. Yeah, so we pay for the X number of years and then we own it at the end. Yeah. Um, I asked him about future future stuff. He said this is the last big you know, vehicle purchase that they have on their horizon currently. Can't talk to five, ten years down the line because who knows, but it's not like next year he's coming and going to be asking us for another large piece of equipment. This is largely the last one. Uh, the other items he had on there was a steel structure for storage. Currently he has more vehicles than his places to park them and we risk doing damage, weather damage to the vehicles by having them be just stuffed outside. Mm -hmm. You're talking about hundreds of thousand dollars of equipment, millions of dollars of equipment, will all of it put together. Um, does not make sense to have it rotting outside. So his, his two options, he has one um, cargo container currently. He had put on the list two items. One was for a second cargo container. The other one was for actually putting in a steel structure that would be a little bit more permanent and a little bit better. Um, the steel structure made more sense to the committee when we discussed it. That's the direction that we think we should go in. That's the one we're going we're gonna to likely propose when we bring our, our um, suggestions to this committee, to this board. Um, which would also mean that the 7500 or whatever it was for the cargo container was also an item that we didn't have to do because he was giving us a and or. Um, so I think all in all we got the, the, the budget for, the, for George down to like 220 I think, something like that. Yep. And then um, between the school, the public safety complex, um, another another cruiser for the uh, police force because their oldest one is now aging out and needs to be replaced. Um, all in all, I think we came up to about 380 or something like that. And the an the annual amount that goes in is how much? Four oh four hundred and three thousand or something like that this year. It w would have been exactly four hundred thousand last year, and then it's plus whatever the two and a half percent is. So. Okay. Uh, that's 410, I guess, just shy of 410. Um, so anyways, that's where we are. It looks like we're in a year where we're not looking at a lot of requests well over our budget, but we're not going to have a ton of money to be able to put into it for future years. Hopefully, we can maybe put 100000 from free cash in, depending on how that goes. We'll see. Um, but anyways, that's where we are right now. Okay. We will obviously have more definitive numbers for this board um, after we meet again. I had one more update too. Before we do that, Jeff, did you have anything else you wanted to add about the capital planning? Uh, 
Well, two, just two minor things. One is to underscore the point of um, if we hadn't passed the override, those three vehicles would take up our entire capital budget for yes. the next five years. So, <laughs> and because we did, we have 300000 to spend elsewhere in town. Yes, um, the second thing that I just wanted to mention is I heard today that uh, the school got the re energy rebate for the mini splits that were installed in the library, I think, last year. So um, that money's coming back. So does that go into the capital for the relation or does that go over to general fund and then... Uh, I was having that discussion with the accountant. I said, if we can put it in capital stabilization, let's do that. If not, leave it in the the account for school HVAC because they're asking for it again and they can and use it next we'll year. we'll balance it out and it'll work. Okay. All right, great. That's always nice to get a little bit of money back. You know? Yep. Um, all right. Sorry, go ahead, Jim. Quick thing. I did have the Boo uh, Board of Oversight meeting for the South County. Mm -hmm. Seniors, uh, two quick things. The feasibility study, we're trying to scramble to get that done. Uh, that was for the Congregational Church in Deerfield, but mm -hmm. we're going to add 123 Palm Tree to it. Yep. To be a piece of it. So they're going to look at the whole thing, try to figure out feasibility study. They had the grant, I think that's running out at the end of June. Yep. And they want to make that. So they asked, if, I, I assume we wanted to include it. So I told them to go ahead yeah. and include so it. So that feasibility study. Is for the entire usage of the building, or is it only for the portion of the building South County um, Senior Center would occupy? So my understanding is it's more we're going to hire you to tell us if this building is good, this building is good, or if there's another building we're not thinking about that would be good. Okay. Not how to use the space. Not how to use the space. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. And then the second thing was uh, just one thing we're looking at considering is a, instead of creating a consortium, which I'm learning about a little bit. It's a little bit different. It gives the, I guess it gives the group a little more power to uh, fund buildings and, and be in more in control of buildings rather than the, the, the host the host municipal town having to deal with all that. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things we're looking at is Shelburne and the three towns up, up near there have, have that kind of agreement and uh, it's just something we're looking at on the board. So in that arrangement, yep. the town wouldn't be purchasing the building, South County Senior Center would Correct. purchase the building. Correct. I think this town would still be the age, it could be the agent, but for the far, as far as the purchase, it would go through the through, so it would be all three towns figuring it out together. Well, and that also addresses one of the concerns that was brought up to Jeff, which is that we'd be taking a building off of the tax rolls for town if the South County Senior Center is buying it. I would assume that we would either continue to collect, be able to collect you know, taxes on that, or we would make the, know, that, that yeah. tax exempt, but with, with that being part of our contribution to the cabal, you know. Yeah. I would I would consider that to be something that I would push for because hey we're either we're you know either we're paying the taxes for it or we're not getting paid for the taxes in which case you know yeah. nice to be, yeah. 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 Uh, but and all around I love the idea of doing that all of the major concerns I've heard from people including myself about the project yeah. um, largely would be solved by it not being owned by Sunderland so Definitely something to. Okay, yeah, so we're still talking about it. Just yep. an update. Great. Anything else from anyone on the board? All right. Um, town administrator update, Jeff? Yeah, no good <laughs> news. No. Um, we did not get our Complete Streets uh, Award that we applied for, so I'm going to try and uh, get in touch with somebody from there and understand. Um, you know how competitive it was, and and where we could have where we could improve in the future for the next round. Um, and then the other thing is um, the building is going to be closed tomorrow due to the expected weather and school closings and um, danger. So I will still be available. Um, I get my voicemails via email. So if you call the town, I, I will call you back. Um, I'm I'm going to be working, but we're just not coming in. So. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is next Monday is President's Day, and then the following Monday I am out of town, so I think it's going to be three weeks before we all meet again. So. Okay. And there's a little bit of a lull in the middle of budget season. Yeah, yeah. everybody gets a little break, recharge, and go back strong. Okay. Wonderful. Um, 
Jess, did you have anything else you wanted to bring up while you're here, or just nope, wanted just to join us? To be here and talk about the lighting issue. Okay, great. Um, in that case, at this time, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. A motion we adjourn. Second. All right, we have a motion made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Three nothing, Jeff. At seven fifty-four p.m.